All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Nathan. How about you? I'm doing fantastic, all things considered. <laughs> um, but we're not going to talk about everything that's going on in the world around us today because uh, I could tune into the news if I wanted to be depressed and, and brought down. I'm here with you because I like having conversations about copywriting. So I think, I think that's what we're going to be talking about today, right? Yes. We're mostly going to take a journey back into the past because we're back with another show in our old masters series, a return visit for the ideas of Claude Hopkins, but something completely different from last time when we pulled out some key points from his book, Scientific Advertising. I said this before, and it's worth repeating. When I first started learning how to write copy, everybody told me, read scientific advertising. It's a book written at the beginning of the 20th century over 100 years ago by Claude Hopkins, who many consider the father of direct response copywriting. I read the book. I read it again. In fact, I read it 15 times. But for today's show, on the advice of my friend and previous copywriters, podcast guest Don Houtman, I looked into an excellent book from long ago called Masters of Advertising Copy. And this book is a compilation of different chapters from different experts and 25 chapters in all. Um, I knew we had to start with the one by Claude Hopkins. His chapter is humbly titled, Some Lessons I Have Learned in Advertising. But to give you an idea of how eternal every one of Claude's Hopkins lessons is, I couldn't find one that was not in active use today. And something that's also in active use today is this, copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims, and if you're writing copy for offers, in highly regulated industries like health, finance, and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So Claude Hopkins wrote this chapter, and it's, you know, it being Claude Hopkins, it's not very flashy. He wasn't a chest thumper. Um, just called Some Lessons I Have Learned in advertising. But these are very, very powerful. I mean, he just didn't hold back. So uh, let, let's jump into them because we got a lot, um, a, a lot of material, five lessons we're going to go over. The first one is demonstration and samples. And the key concept here is that sampling and demonstration, which are really the same thing, they're like different forms of the same thing, make the best way to sell anything. So let me give you an example from his book, and then we can talk about some current day examples. Um, the quote from his book, he had a single mom and the family made silver polish to keep, you know, keep food in the cupboard and, and um, keep, keep the landlord or bill collectors away. So Hopkins would sell this silver polish door to door. And he says, I found that when I met the housewife at the door and talked the polish to her, I hardly sold to one in 10 homes. But when I got into the pantry and cleaned some of the silver, I sold nine times in 10. So going from 10% to 90% by demonstrating the product, that's the key point. And are there examples today? Yeah, there's tons of them. Um, any, almost any Kindle book you want to buy, not even, but 99% of the ones I've seen offer you a free sample chapter. Um, that's sampling, that's demonstrations. Uh, software companies, including some of the software I'm buying these days, some of the apps I'm getting these days, offer a free 30-day trial or a limited function trial, or a you can use it, but it's going to stop working after 20 minutes trial. And same idea. It's a sample. It's a demonstration. Uh, car dealers have the, um, you know, the not only the test drive, but 
um, for people they think are really good prospects, they, they use the puppy dog clothes. They say, take it home for the weekend and try it out and see what you think. And a lot of people can't let go of it once the weekend's over. So those are some examples. And, and here's the key point, I think. Features by themselves usually don't sell, just features. Features and benefits work some of the time, but demonstration in whatever way you can construe it, demonstration where the customer gets to sample the product either virtually in their mind or better yet on their computer or in their hands in their home, that usually works best of all because then people know from direct experience what they're getting and what the benefits will be. Does this bring to mind anything that you've seen or you've been doing? Yeah, I think all the examples that you brought up, anybody can visualize them or they're familiar with them. I have a question though, when it comes to copy specifically, if you're, one of the rules that I try to hold to in copy is only try to sell one thing or only try to have one goal. Um, if I'm trying to sell something, but I also have a free sample version of it, should I have a different sales page for the free sample version of it based on, or, or versus a, a page where I'm trying to actually sell the full version? Should I try to sell both the trial and the full version on the same sales page? Um, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm clarifying what I'm trying to get at, but I can see where if a copywriter doesn't have a clear goal, the, the intent or what they want the reader to do might get muddied up by having a demonstration version. We'll say a, a 30 day version or a, a freemium version where you can get the whole package for $999, but you can get the limited package for free. Should the sales page divert from the, 999 version in order to get people to the free or should that be done on a separate sales page? No, I mean, it's a matter of strategy, either sampling and, and free demo is part of your strategy or it's not. And if it is, um, you, you put everything you got into getting them the sample and having the sample sell it. But one thing you can do, and this is actually, I got from someone I'm working with now, um, on, on one of my own products, which we're putting online, is you can have them download the free sample and then as the thank you page, you can say, hey, if you don't wanna uh, you know, wait um, until later, until your free sample, your limited free sample runs out, you can get the whole thing now. So you can have them download it, make sure there are messages in the free sample to encourage the person to buy. Um, if it's, you know, some kind of software, then, uh, you know, like some things where I get a free sample, the, the first screen I see is, do you want to run this in demo mode or do you want to have it licensed to you? Um, but yeah, I mean, your, your goal, I think, is always to make the sale and, and do you want to keep that in front of people too? Okay. So just for some clarification, should we be promoting both on one page or should we only have one goal for each page? I think you can promote both. Um, it's, it's, like, it's like two routes to get to the same point. Um, you can offer them that, you know, but you, I think you should sell it all, all the way through um, and uh, give them a buy link at the bottom of the page. Thank you. And uh, let's jump on to the next one. Okay. So the next one is uh, the concept of free gift and curiosity. And the key concept here is you can get people interested by offering a free gift. And at least in some cases, you'll do even better if the gift is a mystery until they get it you know, what Claude Hopkins did, which, which I did for a while um, in college, selling pots and pans. He's selling door to door. He was selling aluminum cookware and he said, of course, he wasn't doing it door to door, but um, he was doing it in stores. He said, I found that ads inviting women to an aluminum display brought few responses and the cost was high. 
But when I offered a souvenir, meaning a free gift, on a certain day, I got quick action, and the saving in cost for a visitor paid for the souvenir some 20 times over. Okay, so think about that. Whatever the souvenir was, he was netting um, uh, ahead, assuming, I guess, the salespeople in the housewares department at the department store could sell the damn aluminum cookware after people got there. Um, he found he could get four times as many leads by not even telling people what the free gift was. He says, curiosity is a greater pulling factor than a gift. And examples from today, um, I don't have as many for this one, but um, I think when you offer free shipping, a free shipping, free plus shipping offer, you know, you'll, you'll give someone something at the, at the top of your funnel if they just pay for shipping, it's a sample plus a free gift. On, um, on the mystery, the curiosity thing, I don't know, um, maybe a mystery bonus in addition to other bonuses that could work. I don't, I don't have a lot there. Uh, people always like to feel they're getting the better end of the deal. And this strategy, this technique is a proven way to operationalize the desire of prospects to get the better end of the deal as a way to get more sales. I have uh, an 11 year old daughter and when we're shopping at the grocery store or at Walmart or the toy store, or wherever we're at, a big trend right now in toys is mystery bags where mm -hmm. it's, it's like a, they have these things called LOL dolls or they have, uh, Shopkins, they have these things where you don't know what it is until you get home and open it up. And a lot of times you can buy, they'll, they'll package them with other gifts or other toys. So you buy, uh, you buy the one and then you get a, a bonus, you buy the one toy and you get a bonus toy with it, but you don't know what the bonus toy is until you get home. And it's so crazy because there's a good chance that you're going to, if you buy it, you're going to get one that you already got, but just the mystery of, I want to open it up and see what it is. It's like Christmas time for her unwrapping the presents. And so uh, those toys are always the one that she's more attracted to. So that curiosity, the free gift, but the free gift with the curiosity, um, I real world examples. I see it every time we go down the toy aisle. Well, that's, that's big because you can be sure that those dolls are selling in the millions and they've probably tested what works best. So, and there are you seeing it with your own eyes, your own flesh and blood. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Truth is a lot of the things we sell are boring. Um, I'm sure they're not boring to the business owner, but as copywriters, you end up with all kinds of stuff. And what Claude Hopkins said, one thing he learned was the power of drama with a boring product. Um, key concept here is drama will help you sell a lot more products if you dramatize a boring product. Then you can sell more of it when you couldn't sell it before. So, okay, uh, both of these things are probably not too healthy today, but in the book he says, his mission was to get housewives to replace cooking lard with vegetable shortening. All right. And uh, it wasn't working out very well. And this was one of those make it or break it moments in Claude Hopkins career. He realized he was going to lose his job if he didn't turn things around pretty quickly. So in a Chicago department store with the vegetable shortening, I mean, can you imagine people used to bake cakes with lard, but apparently they did. Um, but he replaced the lard with vegetable shortening. And here's the drama part. He built the largest cake in the world. He advertised it and he made it clear that the shortening was part of the cake. He got 100,000 women into the store in one week to see the largest cake in the world. And he says, I served them samples. I offered premiums to those who would buy that day. The plan was a tremendous success. Okay, that's Chicago. Um, 100,000 women in the store. The, the, whole, the whole campaign went profitable in one week. He scaled it up 
by doing the same thing in the hundred largest cities in the US, building the largest cake in the world. And he said, this made my product a nationwide success. It saved my job, gave me added reputation and taught me to dramatize my subjects when I could. Uh, let me give you a couple examples that come to mind from today. I don't know if you remember this. If you're a Gary Halbert fan, you should. Gary had a Tova Borgnine perfume promotion where he was advertising that someone swore under oath that did not contain an illegal sexual stimulant. And then he had some guy show up at a department store, bodyguard kind of hulking guy with a briefcase handcuffed to him to you know, show this. And this worked so well that they had to, the LA fire marshal had to stop letting people in because the number of people was starting to make it a fire hazard. Another example, right here in San Francisco at Moscone Center, Apple used to do these product intros. Now, if, if you think about it, consumer electronics making it like a worldwide dramatic event, that was Steve Jobs' genius, among other things. Um, and initially, of course, Maybe like in the early 80s, it was only geeks and Apple fans, but fast forward 20, 25, 30 years, and these were like major events covered on the news and you know talked about in social media. And look at what happened. iPads are everywhere, iPhones are everywhere, and Apple is the third most valuable company in terms of market capitalization, in terms of the worth of all of its stock as measured in dollars as of late May. I don't know what's going to happen in the intervening weeks between when we're recording this, but um, it's a pretty valuable company. And, you know, it's the same idea with Jeff Walker launches, very dramatic. The drama adds Jeff Walker style launches. I should say he's taught a whole generation of marketers how to do launches. The drama adds to the interest in the product in a way that's hard to match with anything else when you do it right. And it's hard to get this right. But when you do, you've got a gold mine on your hands. Why is it hard to get right? Because it's like marketing entertainment. Uh, publishing a best-selling book or releasing a hit song or a movie is usually much chancier and harder to do than simply making a lot of money with a good product. I'm going to say Claude Hopkins was a master at this. I, I don't want to say, I feel like it's, it doesn't do it justice to call it a publicity stunt. But if you read his other book, uh, My Life in Advertising, it's just chock full of stories like this. And another guy from around that same period of time, P.T. Barnum. Study P.T. Barnum, and man, he was a master at this as well. Claude Hopkins and P.T. Barnum, if you study what they did in order to generate excitement about otherwise boring things, uh, it's like a master class <laughs> in what you're talking about now. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, uh, my friend Joe Vitale wrote a book about Barnum called There's a Customer Born Every Minute. And uh, I'm not sure I'm allowed to tell you, but David Deutsch actually gave him the title. So, yay, DD. All right. Number four lesson is test everything. And the main thing he was saying here is not just test to see which ad works better, which headline works better, but test small before you scale up. So, Hopkins says, early on in his career, many companies came to him with product ideas they were certain would be winners. And Hopkins says he made several great mistakes by relying on my judgment, Claude's judgment, and theirs, the clients. So this led him to make a rule that he would never again do a large campaign until he had done a small one that worked. He said, I set the limit on a test campaign at $5,000, but most such campaigns cost less. He operated on the principle that I waited to see what the thousands would buy and I let the thousands decide what the millions would do. That's, that's actually kind of deep. Um, here's an example from today. And I'm very open to being corrected because I don't actually do this. And I think you do, Nathan, but um, I'm pretty sure I'm right here. People try dollar a day or $5 a day testing on Facebook both to test the market and get the algorithm used to their ad. And um, then another thing for my own products, I take it a step further. I not only see if they'll sell, okay, what I'm about to say may be heresy. So if 
you know, you're a, you know, morality free marketer, please cover your ears for the next sentence. I also test my stuff to see if it works for other people. I'll, I'll do it in small groups. I'll do it in a seminar. And when I see there's a good track record and a good percentage of success, then I'll, I'll, then only then will I scale up. So what about you, Nathan? Have you had experience with this testing the whole campaign small and then gradually taking it to a higher place? Yeah. And I will say I've made costly mistakes thinking, man, this promo is going to be a winner. It's going to knock it out of the park and not testing and dumping a bunch of money into it and then having it fall flat. So, and I think probably every copywriter has experienced this. Everyone. A lot of times the things that we think are going to be the winners are not. And the things that we think are going to be the duds are the ones that just blow up. And so testing is so important. And you mentioned with Facebook ads and, and, uh, Facebook's not the only one, YouTube as well. Um, you do have the ability to do these small scale, small scale tests before you dump a bunch of money into it. So we're kind of privileged as far as copywriting goes. We have more at our disposal than Claude had back when he wrote this. Um, I can't even imagine what he would be able to do with the technology that we have nowadays. Yeah, that's, that's a scary thought, but, <laughs> but an interesting one. All right, let's let's go to the fifth one, seeking out details that convince. And and the key thing here is your USP or maybe not your USP, maybe just like a key marketing point can be buried in trivia or what the business owner and business execs often call trivia. And sometimes it's the curse of knowledge or familiarity breeds contempt. They know it so well, they figure everyone else does, but everyone else doesn't. This is sort of a well-known story, but a slightly different take on it. When Hopkins took on Schlitz beer as a client, all the advertising brewers were talking about pure beer, but no one was explaining it or proving it. Hopkins, um, you know, overachiever, overpreparer, he went to brewing school. He learned to become a brewer. He learned everything he could about how beer was made. And then he went through the Schlitz brewery he even found out that though the brewery was on the shores of Lake Michigan, which in those days had clean water, the company dug down 4,500 feet to get the purest water. And he really got into the nitty gritty on the pains the company took to make their beer pure. And he used that in his advertising, complete with pictures of plate glass rooms where the beer was cooled and filtered air. What happened is Schlitz proceeded to own the word pure, and it jumped from fifth place to first place in market share for all beers. And he says, quote, largely because I gave convincing reasons for purity and flavor. So got, got a couple of examples from today. Um, you're seeing car dealers on TV make these offers for you to try the car that has been sanitized and untouched by any other human being before you go to your test drive. I don't know if they're going to have the, the guy in a moon suit drive it over to you or what. I don't know exactly how it works. But um, then there's another one. All kinds of delivery services for food are offering similar promises. One pizza company says, their pies are baked at 450 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot, which is, that's only like four degrees less than Fahrenheit 454, right? Um, and never touched by another human being. <laughs> you know, I'm remembering, <laughs> I'm remembering this cartoon from when I was a kid and, and there's this factory and it says, never touched by human being. And they have all these chimps on the line, you know, putting the, <laughs> putting this stuff together. Anyway, uh, hopefully they're not doing that with the pizza. I, I want to I point something else out to you, though. I got this email. So this is a true story. 11 years ago, I went to Ayers, A-Y-E-R-S, hotels, two of them to meet with a client in 2009, 11 years ago, in Orange County. 
haven't been since, but they've kept me on their list. I guess they figure if he's come twice, maybe he'll come a third time. So um, I got this email from them and think about Claude Hopkins and, you know, going through all the details about the plate glass and the washing the bottles four times and the drilling down 4,500 feet. Um, this email is from Ayers Hotel and it, I'm showing for the video viewers, for the audio listeners, this is the email. There are little panels, enhanced training. Team meetings are conducted regularly to reinforce best practices for personal hygiene and include training for up, like, I don't know what, wash your hands or cleaning products. We are using EPA certified cleansers that are CDC compliant and effective against airborne and blood-borne pathogens, including human coronavirus. Uh, even though I don't want to tell them it's an animal coronavirus, that's what's the problem. But anyway, meticulous cleaning protocols. We've implemented cleaning procedures that <laughs> <laughs> include detailed attention to commonly test services. <laughs> you know what that tells me? Before the coronavirus, your rooms were filthy. I know they weren't, but, that, you know, uh, increased cleaning frequency. Public spaces are regularly clean and sanitized by our housekeeping. So, in other words, this exact method that he used is that Hopkins used in the aughts or the tens is being used in 2020 during the coronavirus. Yeah. I want to add something to that. When, when Claude said, hey, this is what the advertising campaign is going to be based upon. We're going to talk about how well the, the glass jars are cleaned and how the boiling points is this and how the hops are selected this way. We're going to let, the, we're going to let them know all of this stuff. Schlitz, the, the people that he was talking to in Schlitz, they said, yeah, but all the beer companies do this. This isn't special. And he said, yeah, but people don't know that that's what all the beer companies do. And so if we're the first ones to tell them, they'll think that we do this exclusively and it'll give us a lead over or an advantage over. And so I can kind of see why the contactless pizza delivery is becoming a selling point or the uh, we meticulously scrub every contact service surface in our motel or hotel or whatever. I can see why. Um, I can see why it's a selling point. Maybe to me and you, we kind of laugh at it, but for the average person, they don't know this stuff. And so they're like, oh, wow, these people are going above and beyond. Yeah, you're right. And to be honest, if I had to go to a meeting in Orange County, that would, I would read that very differently. In fact, I'd probably choose that hotel. I've been there. Their price is good. It's clean. It's a nice place. I think you get a free breakfast. And, um, and they're going way out of their way to keep me from getting sick. So, you know, it's, it's funny, but it's not funny at all. It's, it's, this is, this is life in 2020 copywriters podcast and otherwise. Okay, man. Uh, <laughs> we, we went all over the place and we ended on a note that I didn't think we were going to end on, but a lot of valuable resources in this episode. And for people that want to check out this book, this is the first time I've heard of this book. Uh, who is it written by and where can they find a copy of it? Okay. So again, thanks to, um, former guest and my friend, master copywriter, Don Houtman for telling me it's called masters of advertising copy. It's edited by George Frederick. Um, it's online uh, on Amazon, and, and we'll include a link in the show notes. I'll send you a link for that. Awesome. All right, David, thank you again. I, I always love these uh, lessons of old masters. These are my favorite uh, episodes that we ever do, and um, I know I get a lot of feedback from other people saying the same thing. So thank you for putting the hard work into making this episode possible. And if people want to check out more, they can go to copywriterspodcast.com. And just to tease out, what do we have coming up next week? Well, so I think we're in a time where trust is like really on the brink, no matter where you look, where you go. And so we're going to talk about some uh, copywriting strategies that work in low trust times. Mm, sounds interesting. All right, man. I will catch you later. Okay. Catch you later. Thanks.